Homo habilis, a hominid species that lived in East Africa between 2.4 and 1.6 million years ago. Homo habilis is classified as the first hominin of the Homo species, so the first human-like species. Yet for decades there have been debates and disagreements about the taxonomy of the so-called handyman. Some indeed say that it was the first Homo species, whereas others say it's more like an Australopithecus. And whereas some researchers group together a set of fossils as one species, others say that Homo habilis fossils belong to several subspecies. But taxonomy aside, the variability in fossil remains shows that our ancestors' bodies and minds were changing. And in this video we will take a look at some of these changes, and in particular the brain of Homo habilis. Since we have no fossils of the brain, we have to base our conclusions on cranial volumes and digital endocasts. Several partial skulls have been found, primarily in two regions, the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania and Kobe Fara next to Lake Turkana in Kenya. Furthermore, there are some South African cranial remains that could be considered to belong to Homo habilis, but this conclusion is highly contested. Having said that, it is not even clear whether the findings in East Africa can be attributed to the same species, as there is quite some considerable variability in cranial size and shape. Therefore, the terminology Homo habilis sansulato, which means Homo habilis in a wider sense, has been introduced. And this often includes Homo habilis sensus stricto and Homo rudolfensis. Now let's take a closer look at two examples. It is agreed by most researchers that the cranium KNM ER1813 is a Homo habilis, most likely a female. But besides that, there is the cranium KNM ER1470, which some argue is a male Homo habilis, but others say it's a different subspecies, namely Homo rudolfensis. Both cranial remains have quite some common features, and they do look somewhat alike. But the biggest difference is the difference in cranial volume, which gives an indication about brain size. Whereas the brain volume of KNM ER1813 is about 510 cubic centimeters, that of KNM ER1470 is approximately 750 cubic centimeters. This difference is substantial, but it is not unexpected when looking at the variability at later living Homo erectus, Neanderthals and modern humans. What may play a role as well is sexual dimorphism, which is the observation that males tend to be larger than females, on average. In modern humans, the average difference in height and brain size between males and females is not that big, on average about 10 to 15 percent. However, we know that sexual dimorphism in the earlier living Australopithecus afarensis was quite considerable, about 30 percent. As such, we see that male Australopithecus afarensis brains were significantly larger than those of females. Now, this could also be the case in Homo habilis, but due to the lack of other skeletal remains, the height ratio between male and female Homo habilis is not fully clear. As such, this big difference in brain size between ER1813 and 1470 could be the difference between a male or a female of the same species, or it could indeed be two different subspecies. Now, this debate aside, it is clear that the brains of the earliest homos were significantly larger compared to earlier living hominins. The clear increase in size, as well as in variability of the brain, was not only seen in Homo habilis, because at the same time we see the presence of other species, including Australopithecus sediba, Paranthropus boisei, and a little bit later on the arrival of Homo ergaster. So there was a huge diversity within and between hominin species, around 2 million years ago. This diversity suggests some kind of evolutionary experimentation and several species trying to adapt to various conditions. And as so often is the case in evolution, significant changes in species occur when there is a significant change in the environment. Indeed, an analysis by Bobby and colleagues from 2015 showed that environment in East Africa was noticeably more variable than before, with both open grasslands and wooded areas. Also, there may have been an elevation in volcanic activity, suggesting drastic changes in environment within just a few decades. 
As such, more versatile species would have the advantage. This would explain the presence of multiple hominin species, but also the sudden increase in brain size, as it allows for a single species to be more inventive and creative in adapting to changing environments. With all this variability between and within species, making any conclusions about brain morphology is extremely difficult and there is high uncertainty. Nevertheless, let's look at some general features that have been reported. Overall, we do see a more globular shape of the brain, with the brain positioned a little bit higher compared to the face, rather than behind the face, which is similar to modern humans. Furthermore, some experts have pointed towards increases in frontal and parietal regions, compared to earlier living australopithecines. Now, these conclusions are quite speculative, but to get a better picture, we should take a look at what we know about the behavior of Homo habilis, before looking at the brain. Homo habilis got its nickname, the handyman, because it originally was thought that it was the first species to use and craft stone tools. Ever since, there has been some evidence for tool use by Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus sediba. But it is still accepted that Homo habilis is the first species to consistently craft stone tools and have them in their day-to-day -day arsenal. Numerous stone tools have been found in the same region as Homo habilis fossils, and they date back to the same time. These stone tools are referred to as the Oldowan tools. Although these tools seem to be quite simple, to get a stone with a sharp edge, you need to chop off a flake in a quite precise manner. It clearly shows an increase in dexterity and motoric ability of the hands. But besides the practical skills, the consistency in the technique of making these stone tools over hundreds of thousands of years suggests the successful teaching of making these stone tools to the next generation. Now, whether Homo habilis had any kind of language that is in any way similar to human language is unclear, but it seems unlikely. However, the ability to communicate must have improved significantly. Now let's return back to the brain. When investigating communication in the human brain, two regions should be looked at. The Broca's area, which is important for language production, and the Wernicke's area, which is important for language comprehension. Now, do we see any changes to these regions in Homo habilis? Philip Tobias investigated the Homo habilis crania of the Olduvai Gorge. He found a peculiar thickening of the inferior frontal cortex, which corresponds to the Broca's area in modern humans. Furthermore, this region showed clear morphological differences to earlier Australopithecines, with differences in sulcal patterns. Also, Tobias reported a widening of the inferior parietal cortex, which is slightly above Wernicke's area. In the 35 years since Tobias' report, these findings have been debated and criticized. There is a too small sample, there is a lack of objective reference points on the skull, and there is some bias and human interpretation which means that the results certainly should be viewed with some caution. However, what is interesting is that the observations that Tobias made are also present in several fossil skulls in later living Homo erectus. Altogether, it could suggest that Homo habilis indeed may have had an increased capability of communication with its peers. So, in conclusion, Homo habilis was a species, or, well, may have comprised of multiple subspecies that showed a significant increase in brain size compared to earlier living Australopithecines. However, there was considerable differences in brain size, with some Homo habilis brains being only 10% larger than that of Australopithecus afarensis, whereas other Homo habilis brains were about 80% larger than that of Australopithecus afarensis. It is possible that this variability reflects increased versatility towards a changing environment, which may have also led to the birth of crafting stone tools and possibly improved communicative skills. Anyway, that's it. We hope you enjoyed the analysis of the brain of Homo habilis. If you did, consider giving this video a like. And as always, we hope to see you the next time.